So we've learned that eukaryotes are much more complex than prokaryotes. And hopefully you're wondering how did that happen. I mean, if you think about it for a minute, um, you know, it costs a lot more to rent a house than a studio apartment, right, where everything is in the same room. Um, and so what we're going to be concerned about in this video is just how it is that eukaryotes got the money to build such complex houses. The first thing we need to do is circle back around to a molecule called ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And it's often referred to as the energy currency of the cell. And that's because um, partially breaking this molecule down and releasing that energy is what's used to pay, quote, my air quotes are going here, pay for work that gets done in the cell. This is a space filling model of ATP with one, two, three phosphates stuck on there. All right. So I'm going to show you a little bit about how the ATP molecule is made because it will help you understand how it gets used. So you have an adenine. Adenine is one of the four bases that nitrogen containing bases that's present in nucleic acids. You have a ribose sugar. Ribose and adenine together are called adenosine. Don't need to remember that. Just remember you've got adenine, ribose, and then if you have a single phosphate, you have adenosine monophosphate, so one phosphate. If you have two, you have adenosine diphosphate. The prefix di means two. If you have three, then you have adenosine triphosphate or ATP. So this is a structural diagram. This is a space filling model. So why am I showing you this? Well, the way that ATP works in our cells and the way that it is used to transfer energy from one place to another is by breaking that bond. As that bond is broken, energy becomes available to do work in the cell. When we talk about synthesizing ATP, by and large, we do not mean building this entire structure. What we mean is adding back the third phosphate group. That brings us to the ATP, ADP cycle. This is a really critical thing to remember, the ATP, ADP cycle, which means you're going from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate and back again. So to synthesize ATP, right, you, we have ADP, and then inorganic phosphate, which is often written P with a little sub I. That's a, a dehydration synthesis reaction. As you can see, we've got water as a product. That phos third phosphate is reattached. Now to use the energy that we've just stored right here, in this bond, what we have to do is a hydrolysis reaction. Remember, hydro means water, lysis means cut or break. So to access the energy 
in ATP, which all living things, all cells on this planet use as a rechargeable battery molecule, you need water. All right, so the ATP, ADP cycle, again, to generate or regenerate ATP, the reactants you need are ADP and inorganic phosphate. This is an anabolic reaction. You're going from something, you're putting two simpler things together to make one more complex thing. The energy to do that comes from breaking glucose down into its components. Using ATP in the cell requires a molecule of water. So the reactants now are ATP plus a molecule of water. That's a hydrolysis reaction. It releases energy to do work in the cell. And it also generates a certain amount of what we call waste heat. Heat is defined as random movement of molecules, right? So, and it's unavoidable. Every time you transform energy, some of it is lost to usefulness because it takes this more random, less ordered form. So types of work that get done in the cell, chemical work, so taking amino acids and stitching them together into proteins, or copying DNA, which involves taking nucleotides and stitching them together into another chain of nucleic acid. Mechanical work, so think about the um, the contraction of muscles, which is the func which is a function of the contraction of muscle cells, and then finally, transport work. So moving things around within the cell, and also moving things either into the cell from outside or from the inside of the cell, tossing them out. All right, so we've got the ATP ADP cycle. Now, I said all living things use this cycle as a way of paying for work in the cell. So we still haven't sort of addressed this idea, like how did cell eukaryotes get to be more complex? Where did they get all of this extra energy currency, this extra money to pay for fancy structure? Well, they found, air quotes again, a way to capture more of the energy from food molecules. And that's where the mitochondrion comes in. Mitochondria is the, is the plural, mitochondrion is singular. A mito mitochondria are membrane-bound organelles, but they have a lot of other unique characteristics. So the first crazy thing is that billions of years ago, mitochondria were free living bacteria, prokaryotes. How do we know that? Well, they have their own DNA in the form of a, cir a circular chromosome, right? Eukaryotic chromosomes are long strands that are coiled up into the familiar chromosome shape. They also have different, they have their own ribosomes um, that are slightly different than the ribosomes you find in eukaryotes. They also can divide on their own even without the cell dividing. And in fact, that's one way that your muscle cells become um, acclimated to increased demand when you start working out they produce more mitochondria, which allows for more energy. 
we're not used to thinking of it this way, but oxygen is a poison. Um, and that's because it is so electron greedy. It's electronegative. It's, if you see a single oxygen atom run screaming from the room, um, because it will, it's what's called a reactive oxygen species or uh, atom, and it's going to pull electrons away from important molecules, and that compromises the function of our cells. So mitochondria were once free-living prokaryotes. At some point, billions of years ago, either the proto or pre-eukaryote captured the proto-mitochondrion um, and engulfed it but didn't digest it, or they entered into what's called a symbiotic relationship where they both get something and neither harms the other. In any case, um, with few exceptions, all of our cells have them, and um, they're no longer capable of living on their own. At least no one's been able to culture them um, without a human cell. Last kind of groovy thing about uh, mitochondria is that by and large you only inherit them from your mother. So the, the um, animal eggs are the largest cells that are created in our species and they come preloaded with everything that you need to get life off to a good start. Uh, but they only have half of the genetic material that's needed. Sperm, on the other hand, are DNA delivery vehicles and pretty much not much more. So they deliver the other half of the DNA to the egg. Fertilization happens and now we have a full set of, two full sets of chromosomes, which is what you need. All right, so if you remember anything from high school biology, it's probably that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Um, we find them in both animal and plant cells, and the secret, the superpower of the mitochondria is that they are capable of taking the massive amount of chemical energy present in the bonds of glucose molecule and repackaging it into smaller, more useful units in the form of ATP. That process is called aerobic cellular respiration. And what I'm showing you in this slide is the summary reaction for aerobic cellular respiration. There are dozens of reactions that go into this, but if we simplify it all, this is, these are the reactants. what you have to have to start the process. These are the products. All right, so we've got glucose, which has the chemical formula C6H12O6, and six molecules of oxygen. And you need six in order to break the glucose down completely that will produce six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. You also need a tiny bit of energy to get this process started in the form of two ATP. Believe it or not, you're gonna use up two ATP in order to generate more. ATP. Now, the function of this reaction is clearly not to make carbon dioxide, which is a waste product, and it's really not to make water. 
it is to capture the bond energy that's found in these oxygen and in the glucose molecule and repackage it in the form of ATP. Please, please, please remember this equation. It's the one equation you need to know in this class other than the ATP ADP cycle. Um, and I guarantee you're going to see it on your exam. All right. So if you remember anything from high school biology, which you don't need to, but if you do, right, you may remember that there's some relationship between aerobic respiration or aerobic cellular respiration and a process called photosynthesis. Photo means light, synthesize means to make. So photosynthesis literally means to make with light. Plants, as well as algae um, and certain other um, organisms are capable of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration are at this point part of a global cycle. And what I mean by this is that the ingredients or the reactants for photosynthesis are carbon dioxide and water. The products of photosynthesis are six oxygen molecules as well as a single glucose molecule. Right? We just said aerobic cellular respiration is glucose and oxygen that gives rise to carbon dioxide and water. And that's what we mean by saying that they're locked in a, a global cycle. So this is photosynthesis. And this is aerobic, meaning needing oxygen, cellular respiration. All right. All right. So aerobic respiration has three stages where the reactants or the products of one stage are the reactants in the next stage. I'm going to walk you through this. Bottom line, you need to know where each of these three processes happens as well as the order in which they happen if oxygen is required, and how many ATP you can, um, you can synthesize from each. So we have glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, which you might have learned as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. The prefix glyco means glucose, lysis means to cut or break. So glycolysis, it makes sense it would be the first step because the first thing you have to do is take the glucose and break it apart into a smaller bundle of atoms. All right, so let me walk you through this complicated image. All the way on the left, we have um, a tiny blood vessel, a capillary, um, and that is where the reactants for cellular respiration are going to come from. Then we have the phospholipid bilayer, which is the boundary between the space outside the cell and the cytoplasm inside the cell. We have a supersized mitochondria. mitochondrion, um, which is where the bulk of aerobic cellular respiration takes place. You'll notice that there is um, this red strange shape embedded in the cell membrane, and that represents a transport protein. Glucose is too large 
to diffuse into the cell directly through the cell membrane. And so it has to, once it um, is out of the blood vessel, it has to be carried into the cell using a transport protein. And then we have the five molecules that are the most important uh, for our understanding of aerobic cellular respiration. We have glucose here, and we're looking at um, ball and stick models for all of these. Um, we've got oxygen, O2, we have carbon dioxide, we have H2O, water, and then we also have a molecule called pyruvate. Notice that glucose is a six carbon molecule. The black dots in the glucose um, ball and stick model represent carbons. And glucose, the first thing that's gonna happen is it's going to be broken down into a three carbon molecule called pyruvate. All right, so oxygen can diffuse through the cell membrane because it's small and nonpolar. Glucose has to go through the transport protein. And the first step that's gonna take place is glycolysis. Glycolysis splits the six carbon glucose into two three carbon pyruvate molecules also produces some electrons, free electrons that are gonna be carried into the mitochondrion. Glycolysis, right, you, as you can see in the image, it takes place in the cytoplasm and it produces a net increase of two ATP. The next step in the process is referred to as the citric acid cycle, which you might have learned as the Krebs cycle. The citric acid cycle uses the pyruvate that was produced by glycolysis. The outcome of the citric acid cycle is a net gain of two more ATP and six carbon dioxide molecules. The third step uses some of the electrons that were um, freed up by both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, and they are transported into the mitochondria or moved through to a different section of the mitochondria to take part in the electron transport chain. Now for the electron transport chain to function, you need oxygen molecules, which is why we've got oxygen showing up here. And the electron transport chain produces a remarkable 32 ATP as well as six water molecules. So if we think about that for a second, right, we've got glucose, think about the summary reaction. We've got glucose plus six oxygen molecules yields six carbon dioxide molecules and six water molecules, as well as energy that's used to recharge ATP. So this is a, a text summary of cellular respiration. I'll let you guys read through that at your leisure since we just, I just went through it with you. As I said earlier, you need to know um, where each part of aerobic cellular respiration occurs. If oxygen is required, how many ATP can be generated in the process, and also the order of those processes. So we have glycolysis, 
which literally means the breaking of glucose, that occurs in the cytoplasm. You have a net gain of two ATP, and you do not need oxygen. The second phase is called the citric acid cycle. It takes place inside mitochondria, and it leads to another two ATP being produced. I'm going to put a question mark here for just a second. We'll come back to that. The third is the electron transport chain. It's actually a set of proteins that are embedded in the uh, mem inner membrane of the mitochondria. So it happens inside the mitochondria and you can get up to 32 ATP, which gives us a total of 36 ATP from a single glucose molecule if everything's working perfectly. As you could see if you look back at the diagram in the previous slide, you absolutely need oxygen for this process. Now, why did I put a question mark for the citric acid cycle about oxygen? Well, strictly speaking, you don't need oxygen for the citric acid cycle to work. But the way that biochemistry works is that chemical reactions are linked to one another. And so if we have the buildup of electrons from the citric acid cycle and glycolysis, but we have no oxygen around, the electron transport chain can't work. And that will feed back on the citric acid cycle and cause it to stop. So I always say, eh, as the answer to is oxygen required. Um, because you could answer that question either way. I will be very, very clear in asking a question um, about, if I ask you about the citric acid cycle um, and oxygen. Um, okay, so one of the things that we do when we're first teaching about aerobic cellular respiration, we always use glucose as the molecule that we're combusting, that we're burning. But it's true that you can burn the monomers of other, carbohyd other carbohydrate monomers. So you can burn fructose, um, you can burn ribose and deoxyribose. You can burn fatty acids. You can burn glycerol. You can also burn amino acids. Although if your body is healthy, you are not typically burning amino acids. Um, the only reason you burn amino acids is if you've exhausted the supply of fatty acids and carbohydrate monomers. Our bodies don't take proteins apart into amino acids just to, to burn them because they invest a lot of energy in building them up. So here we are back at the ATP, ADP cycle. So now you, so in this video, we've talked about how it is that eukaryotes have been able to become so complex. And that was because of a little organelle, which once upon a time lived all on its own, called the mitochondrion, which you can always recognize because um, it looks sort of like a little kidney bean, usually, um, the way it's drawn, and it has these um, folded membranes inside as well as around the outside. In the next two videos, we're going to talk 
about um, exactly what kinds of complex structure we see in eukaryotic cells.